You're thinking oh, he's not even on the program. How did he sneak on? Um, and he's going to show us graphs. Oh, God, it's too early. Um, I'm going to go through uh, two pieces of work that um, you won't have seen. Um, the first one is the, uh, a nutritional survey of homeless people in London. Um, we, uh, we did this uh, last year. It was very peer-led. It was led by uh, the wonderful Bora, who, who uh, can't be here today, but will be here tomorrow. And we've got another session tomorrow where we can explain this in more detail, and we'd love to share the, uh, the methodology and the way we did it and make this a larger thing. Um, and I'll uh, impress upon you as to why. Um, there's been no assessment of the nutritional status of homeless people uh, in London for 20 years. Uh, and in fact, that last attempt included no anthropomorphic measurement. So there was no measurement of body mass index, MUAC, etc. There was no um, uh, measurement of their actual um, state of malnutrition, as it were. Um, so our knowledge of nutrition is pretty clear. Um, malnutrition is a killer. Uh, your brain um, wants to survive. Your, your, your brain will eat your myocardium in order to survive. Uh, malnutrition impairs your immunity. It profoundly immunocompromises you, uh, and it wrecks all the big systems, your cardio, your respiratory, your GI system, and it profoundly delays healing. Um, it has a profound effect on your mental health, <clears throat> leads to depression, anxiety, um, has a huge increased re risk of hospital admission, delayed recovery, and premature death. And despite the lack of measurement in this country, malnutrition is a well-documented risk factor for homelessness internationally. So, quite simply, we wanted to undertake a comprehensive nutritional assessment of people in London who were... Um, using the hostels, day centres, street kids, kitchens, etc. These were people who um, were screened uh, alongside the, uh, the find a treat van. Uh, we wanted to generate some, some evidence. There's a huge evidence vacuum there. So it was peer led. Um, uh, peer basically delivered a, an anonymised uh, uh, questionnaire and measured their body mass index. Um, it was purposive sampling, i.e., it was opportunistic alongside the unit. And we also included a 24-hour food recall diary. To give it some validity, we used three validated tools, <clears throat> the malnutrition universal screening tool, um, the drug screening tool, DAST, and the shortest version of Audit C, um, the fast alcohol screening tool. Uh, this is so we could control for drug and alcohol use, etc. 267 participants, 80% male, uh, very much reflecting the, uh, the, the population who are out there, mean age 44, just over half are UK born, about 40% using illicit drugs, predominantly crack and heroin. Um, three quarters were currently or recently sleeping rough and, and half had been homeless for more than five years. So let's cut to the chase. Blue is the homeless cohort and we constructed the, um, the beige cohort, as it were, by using three years' worth of um, Health Survey for England data, matching an age-sex-matched housed cohort on a ratio of 1 to 20. And as you can see, there is a complete shift to the left in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the BMI profile in the, uh, in the homeless population. Um, they were profoundly different, uh, measurably different. Uh, and in fact, um, I mean, headline, 17% had a BMI of less than 18.5. That's versus 1.3% of the general population. That gives you a risk ratio of 14-fold. And this didn't account for a lot of people in fluid retention due to uh, liver problems, cirrhosis, etc. cetera. So um, this is an underestimate. Now, when we look at malnutrition screening tool, MUST, universal screening tool, this tool also accounts for recent unexplained weight loss and is in fact a, a validated and better measure of your risk in terms of need for intervention. Based upon the MUST tool, one in four, 25% of the population screened were in need of a nutritional intervention. Now you've seen the slope and cliff uh, approach to life on many an occasion. 
This just crudely shows you by indices of multiple deprivation from the least deprived to the most deprived population, the slope in terms of your risk of having a very low body mass index. And as you can see, the cliff is clear in terms of the homeless population with a, uh, a, 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 an order of magnitude of risk that's 14-fold. Now, we included the 24-hour recall food diary um, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, basically fitting the, uh, um, the, the, the reported patterns of eating as best we could into these, into these uh, what, what could be considered normal um, routines of eating. The white uh, uh, is nothing. The gray is uh, a snack, and by a snack I mean a... <clears throat> a bag of crisps or a Snickers bar. A meal would constitute a bowl of breakfast cereal, a couple of rounds of toast, or uh, some chips, or a pret sandwich, um, and a meal with fruit and veggies in the dark green. Uh, so this raised a really interesting issue for us, and the issue is starvation. Um, very prolonged periods of no food. A very clear relationship between substance use and risk of starvation. Uh, and in fact, amongst participants who were reporting drug use, 60% um, of them uh, were going f with no food for a whole day or more every week. Um, that's a staggering uh, amount of starvation. So the malnutrition data that we've gathered here, which is again, I remind you, the first time it's been measured in London, and the first time any kind of assessment of the nutritional status of the homeless population has been attempted with it to include BMI in this country, um, shows that it's an incredibly common and severe problem. Based on the MUST data, one in four of the population that we sampled who are extremely representative, this is a large cross-sectional survey, one in four are in urgent need of a, a, a nutritional intervention. None whatsoever met the, diet, the minimum dietary requirements, access to sort of uh, the right foods is a really big issue. Um, if you're out on the street, you're um, you know, more likely to uh, encounter um, strange uh, rocket-filled combinations of sandwiches from Pret than, than anyone in their right mind would ever want to eat. Um, I myself am not a great lover of rocket, but it's probably the principal green source of food that's available to people. Um, very cheap leaf to grow. Um, but the bottom line is, uh, this is completely the wrong food. Um, we think about a refugee camp scenario where people are um, quite profoundly malnourished. They are protein and energy deficient. And the foods that are available, um, with the best intentions, is a stack of empty carbs. Um, it's large portions that if, you, if you're going to get anything down your neck that's going to be remotely useful, you've got to eat a pretty large portion of empty carbs. We're providing the wrong foods in, in every setting, in the day centres, in the hostels and in the street kitchens. It's the wrong food. The population of protein and energy malnourished, one in four of them need a nutritional intervention and none of them reported receiving any oral nutritional supplement, despite the fact that many of them are engaging with drug treatment services. We used to see, uh, you know, good old Enshaws dished out um, alongside many uh, uh, harm minimization interventions. But there's 350 calories nearly in 125 mils of Enshore. Get two of those inside you and you'll have a profoundly different outcome. Um, the thing that kind of worried me greatly was the starvation issue. Uh, many of you will have heard of refeeding syndrome. If you don't eat for a prolonged period of time and then you have a, uh, a gutful, you get an absolute electrolyte storm. You have pr a profound metabolic disturbance which can lead to death. Uh, and I think um, it's a completely unrecognized risk factor. It's an unrecognized contributor to um, the amazingly high levels of of drug-related deaths that we've, we've seen reported. We've seen a, um, a huge increase in drug-related deaths uh, in a population that we can now evidence are profoundly uh, cachectic and are at high risk of um, serious, uh, serious health consequences. Um, when we think about diet, 
it's so pro profoundly fundamental, and yet we, we, we're not thinking about diet enough. Um, Diet's one of the few modifiable risk factors that's available to us. You can really do something about diet, and yet we're not doing very much about diet at all. Um, in terms of the austerity link, this is a one-off cross-sectional snapshot, as it were. Um, I think if I'd been able to measure this on every single person who jumped on the van in the last 10 years, we could have probably indexed linked BMI to austerity. It's that linked. Um, but malnutrition is clearly evidenced as a significant contributor to increased risk of morbidity and mortality, which brings me on to um, what was just mentioned in terms of the Bureau for Investigative Journalist work, uh, Journalism work that was released on Monday, which coincided with uh, the release of a paper that we'd been putting together for a number of years. Um, 800 people almost, that's 11 a week in the last 18 months, that's mind-blowing. So this piece of work was kicked off um, many years ago when uh, um, we used to be able to invite uh, a minister to the conference and expect a check at the end of it. Um, those days are gone, unfortunately, but nevertheless we've been using that particular check to good effect. And this is one of the first, other than the uh, protocol which was recently published, is one of the first pieces of evidence to come out of that paper. Um, it's based on the uh, specialist integrated homeless and healthcare schemes that were launched with a very um, uh, a targeted 10 million quid, uh, which, which was pumped into secondary care services, services that are engaging with a population in secondary care. It's a big old sample. It's got nearly 4,000 homeless people identified accessing those services from 17 different uh, specialist integrated services across the country. Um, that 4,000 people equates to nearly 14,000 uh, admissions. And as a comparator group, NHS Digital provided for us a random sample of people in the poorest um, uh, indice of deprivation um, who were accessing those same services but not coming into the attention of those teams, but the same hospitals in the same time period. So it's a fair old adjusted sample in that respect. And it raises some rather profound and interesting questions. Um, we're very obsessed with measuring death in, uh, in, in homeless people because it's one of the few things we, we can measure. Um, and our attention is almost always drawn, particularly in terms of the biases within the literature, to those extreme but nevertheless rather rare events, external causes, suicide, etc. Um, where the relative risks are off the map in terms of a comparator group. Um, what we miss there is the sheer burden of disease, burden of death attributable to um, conditions that are treatable, the chronic conditions, the chronic morbidities. So as a kind of headline figure, in the poorest communities served by these hospitals, we had a median age of death of 72, and 23% of those deaths were uh, from good conditions that were uh, treatable. Um, that equates to 7.5% of the uh, reference population there having died in that three-year follow-up period. For the homeless, we've lost 20 years of life, 20 years of life lost with a median age of death of 52, and almost a third of the deaths from treatable conditions. Uh, ignore that 15.5% in terms of the group died because, I mean, while it's accurate in terms of proportion, it's way off the scale in terms of any expression of risk for the simple reason that it's not adjusted for age. If you think about the age cohort, the profile of, uh, of, of age in the, in, 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 in the IMD5 group included a very high proportion as is common amongst people who use hospital services, of people over 70. Um, the, the median age uh, in, the, uh, in the homeless cohort was, in, was, was 44. So it's not a comparable group in that sense. The future work will adjust for age and will also compare across the entire IMD group and that will give a, a rather eye-watering expression of the difference in, in terms of overall risk of death. So, these schemes, 
brilliant, necessary, essential as they are, um, I mean, they're obviously serving a population that are at really high risk of premature death. Um, and these deaths, uh, as I'd like to reiterate one more time, one in three are from treatable conditions. This is really clearly pointing towards a failure in the system uh, in terms of early intervention. Um, we're looking at a, um, a failure to access the wonders of modern preventative uh, and uh, intervention medicine, which has completely changed the landscape of the management of chronic disease. And people can expect to live um, you know, not only a long, but a high quality life with, 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 with many conditions that, that, uh, um, that, 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 that were deemed to be a, a medical challenge some years ago. The field has changed. Um, it's moved on very nicely for the entire population, with the exception of the population that we serve, who have massively missed out on any opportunity to access early intervention care. Now, if we're going to put it into perspective, and we keep talking about a comparison group for homeless people, we keep comparing them to the people who are in the most deprived sectors of society. And that's really a throwback to this idea that we need to defend ourselves against the accusation that um, people who end up on the street are more likely to be drawn from more socially deprived communities. And we did this originally to try and, to try and create persuasive arguments. Well, we've won those persuasive arguments in terms of homelessness is an independent risk factor for massively elevated mortality, even after we account for extremes of social deprivation amongst the house population. And so I would say to you today that that time's over. Let's not peg mortality in people who are dying homeless to the most extremely poor sectors of our society. Let's peg mortality to the overall aspiration in terms of what health uh, um, healthcare and early intervention should provide because these data make it extremely clear that in the absence of a complete step change to shift away from firefighting at the end of life to actually ensuring that people have the right to access what is considered normal in terms of early intervention and preventative primary care in the absence of that there are thousands of people who are paying the ultimate price. Thank you very much.